Go ahead and be seated. Wow, what a great time of praise and worship we've had again today. It just seems like it gets better all the time. And man, it's good to see the choir getting fuller and fuller all the time. Amen. Hey, if you want to be a part of that, guess what? You can, you can come. Amen. Hey, it's time for our kids to go to Children's Church. So kids up to sixth grade, come on down. Miss R is right over here. And they'll be ready to take you upstairs. And y'all are going to have a great time. And uh, parents, remember, your child will not come back in the service, but you'll pick them up across the hall in the fellowship hall, and they'll be down there when church is over uh, later on this morning. So, uh, man, it's good to see so many kids in our services today. And so uh, y'all get ready and head on up. And today we're going to be talking about a compelling service. Over the last few weeks, I've been talking to you about service. We've been all year long, our theme has been connecting to serve in 2021. We talked about connecting uh, to, to God. We talked about connecting to the local body, the church. And then we've been talking about connecting uh, to people. Then the last few weeks, we've talked about now connecting and then now serving. And we talked last week about convenient serving, the idea of serving when it's convenient to us and when we want to. Today, what I want to look at is the compelling service, this service that is one of compelling people to come, to be a part of, of what God is doing uh, to reach people for Jesus. And we're going to be looking today in the book of Luke chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're just going to be reading the, the one verse, but it's the small verse in, the, in this big text that's basically talking about uh, the idea of reaching people, going out and compelling them to come in. In Luke chapter 14, we see the story of the, the Great Supper, the parable of the Great Supper, where uh, the, the master had prepared a huge meal for people to come, and he invited people to come, and for whatever reason, they decided that what they were doing was more important than going to this Great Supper, and, and so they began to make excuses as to why they couldn't make it. They had so much going on in their lives, and so being a part of that just wasn't on the priority list. And so then we see that they declined. And then the master decided, told his servants, said, okay, well, I've invited all these guests, but they've refused. So now what I want you to do is I want you to go out and I want you to find people to bring in. So the master did that, or the servant did that. And, and so once the servant brought him in, he said, hey, I've gone everywhere and got everybody I know, but yet we still have a lot of room. Then he tells them, he brings them to this text that I believe is the, the, the crux of the whole thing, the whole reason that this parable was even being told, and it's the idea that we are to be compelling to people. We ought to, as a church, finally get to a point that we, if you will, wake up and realize it's important that we reach people for Jesus. It's important that we do what we're called to do. So look in your Bibles in the book of Luke chapter 14, verse 23, and if you have your Bibles and you're ready, would you please stand if you're able to, and you at home join us as well as we look at this text of what the master told the servant after he told him that there was still room for them, for more people to come. Starts at verse 23, it says, Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and listen to this, and compel them to come in, that my house might be filled. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the great time of praise and worship. And now, Lord, as we move into your word, I pray that your spirit would continue to settle in on us and speak to our minds and our hearts. And Lord, as we open up to you to receive your word, some encouragement in our spirit, but also, Lord, a call to those who may be here or those who are at home watching, the Father that, that may not know you, the Lord, that you would draw them to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Father, use this message and use the words that I'm about to say, Lord, and let them not be my words, but let them be yours. And this message be yours as well, Father. And I pray that, God, the response would be from your church and for those who are hearing as you desire for them to be. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we look at this text, we see that the Master told the servant. 
Now, my friends, can I tell you today that Jesus is our master and we're the servants, amen? So he's really talking to us to, to be the ones to go. And so what I want to look at here in this text, if you will, there's several little points that I want to bring up very quickly. The first one is he called it a, a great banquet. And we see that when Jesus began the parable, he said, this is a great banquet. Now, listen, please understand, it's not just, it wasn't just a meal. It wasn't just they got together and said, hey, let's throw out some sandwiches and, and let's just be able to have a good time together. And we'll throw out some finger foods and, and we'll, we'll do it. But no, what he called it was, he said, it was a, a great banquet. In other words, it was something like these people that were bringing, brought in, it was going to be something they had never seen before. It was going to be something so much more than they ever thought possible. They never even dreamed about how great this was going to be. And so as we're talking about this today, I began to think about, as God was laying this on my heart, I began to think about the idea of what, what is it that God offers us? There's a lot of times we think in life, well, God offers us a better life. God offers us life after death. And so we kind of, if, if we're not careful in the church, and even I as the pastor, if we're not careful, we can get kind of flippant with what, what we have. Amen? Well, we have peace. We have a better life. We have eternal life. And we just say it almost like it's not a big deal. But can I tell you, the Bible tells us there is nothing that we can ever see or nothing that we can ever imagine that is better than what awaits for us. So when we receive Jesus into our lives, my friends, listen to me, we have been given something great, not just something, but something amazing. The best thing that could ever happen to an individual is they give their life to Jesus Christ. Okay, let me say that again. Now, you're going to be ready for this one, all right? The best thing that could ever happen to any individual is they give their lives to Jesus Christ. Amen. There you go, church. It's, we need to know that, amen? We need to say what God has given us has been amazing. We sing about amazing grace, amen? Amen. That, that it's, some, it's the best thing that could ever happen to us. As a matter of fact, I have never heard an individual when they gave their life to Christ saying, you know what? I wish I hadn't have done it so soon. I wish I'd wait about another 10 years. Then I could have given my life to Christ. And man, I think I'd have liked that better. Every time someone finally gives their heart to Jesus, the thing I hear over and over and over is, man, I wish I'd have done it sooner. I wish I'd have given my life sooner Amen. because that's the, the amazing thing that God has given me now. I've wasted so much time. I could have been having this in my life right now because it is, again, a great banquet. And so he tells the people that there was a master that prepared a great banquet. And in other words, it was the best quality that they were ever going to have. They were, they've never been a part of something that was this. The master he saved no expense. He gave everything to this banquet. And it's the best thing they were ever going to have, the best quality of food, the best quality of fellowship, the best quality of anything. Here, my friends, as we move it into our time, can I tell you there is nothing better that God has given us than Jesus Christ. That there is nothing, listen to me, there is nothing in this world that is, is as good as being saved through Jesus Christ. Nothing. You can't find anything in this life that's better than that. As a matter of fact, it's the idea of the, 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 the thing of eternity versus temporal. This is the quality that we're talking about, is that what Jesus gives us never stops. It doesn't go away. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor dust nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. In other words, he says, store up that because the best thing we'll ever do is give our lives to Jesus Christ. And everything that we have from him is eternal, that it's the best quality. Man, everything that we have on this earth is cheap, amen? amen. And it breaks, it falls apart. As a matter of fact, how many of you have ever said, and this, this is mainly for us older folks, boy, they just don't make things like they used to. Y'all said that? Amen. Just don't make it like they used to. So in other words, we're paying more for less quality. 
And so as we continue to look at things on this earth, that's exactly what we need to understand is, man, they don't make it good anymore. As a matter of fact, nothing, nothing, nothing on this earth is going to last. But Jesus gives us eternity. My friends, that's quality. That's quality. And so we need to be focused on that stuff. But not only is it the best quality, but it's the most quantity. In other words, what he was bringing them was not just uh, just a little dinner here. It was never ending. It was going to be an all-you-can-eat buffet plus more. How many of y'all like all-you-can-eat buffets? Now, this, okay, before COVID days, now you can be honest. All-you-can-eat buffet means what? All-you-can-eat. And for most of us, it meant more than we should eat. Amen? The quantity was there. The quantity was there. In other words, he was telling them, once you come into me, once you come into this dinner, once you come into this great banquet, you will never, ever go hungry again. Jesus also told a lady, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Here's a shameless plug for tonight. We have the the, the never thirst uh, service tonight. Man, you want to come and you'll want to be a part of that. And you at home, you're going to want to tune in. Because we're going to be talking about uh, and and singing, man, the the choir's going to do a knockout of the park job. I heard them Wednesday night, and that's an amazing thing they're doing. We're going to have some, hopefully, a, a service of just spiritual renewal tonight. We're going to have a baptism. And maybe you notice a tank over here. That's what that's for. We're going to do baptisms tonight. We're going to do baptisms in a different way than we've done them here since I've been here. But we just want this night to be one of those to realize that, man, when you come into Jesus, you're never going to thirst. Man, he's going to take away everything from you, and he's going to give you stuff that's going to replenish over and over and over. And so he was telling them that this banquet was never going to run out. So we see the idea of the most quantity we're ever going to have. But then not only he says the great banquet, but then here's where the command goes. He says, go. He told the servant, everything is ready. It's all prepared for them. Now what I need you to do is I need you to go. Now you understand it was a command. He didn't say, hey, If you don't have anything better going on today, I would like you to think about going out and telling people about this great banquet that I've been preparing for them. He didn't say any of that. He said, I want you to go. Now, remember, he was the master. The other one was the servant. So the servant didn't look at him and go, well, you know, I would love to go, but today's just not a good day. I've had family in. It's been kind of busy. We're all a little tired. Not, not today. He said, no, I command you to go because there needs to be an idea that we're being commanded to do this. It's not, again, just a, a, a worry about the convenience. And it requires action on our part. Last week I shared with you a message on convenience doing it when we feel like we can doing it when we're in the mood doing it whenever things fall into place and i don't have anything better to do then we'll be convenienced then i'll be able to do it but too often the church gets the command backwards and we want people to come to us rather than us going to them I've shared with you many, many times as the pastor here that if we're not careful in the church, we get into this what I call the field of dreams mentality, that if we build it, they will come. If we open the doors, they will come. If we turn on the lights, they will come. If we give them good air conditioning, they'll come. If we give them good seating, they'll come. If we give them this, they'll come. If we give them that, they'll come. Listen, my friends, look around here. We got open spots, amen? Amen. People don't do it just because you open up. The Bible says that we need to go to them. We, need to, we have been commanded to go, but not wait for them to come to us. But we need to be willing as a church to step out and to go to them. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he says, preach the word. Now listen. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Now what does out of season mean? That means when it's not convenient, when it's not something you're really thinking about, it's not on Sunday morning when this is when we all gather together anyway, so the preacher preaches. He says, man, we ought to be willing to do it out of season. That means on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, anytime the master calls, 
we ought to be willing to go and do it. In season and out of season. And this is what he tells them to do. He says, convince. Convince them that what you have is better than what they have. Convince them where you're headed is better than where they're headed. Convince them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Convince them of that. Rebuke them, exhort them with all long suffering and teaching. Do it in season and out of season. Do it at all times in our lives, but not worried about the convenience, but also not worried about the location. You know, we sing that song sometimes in church, wherever he leads, I'll go. Do we really mean that? Because that means, Lord, I'm not worried about where you're wanting me to go, just the fact that you want me to go. So wherever you tell me, and if it is to my workplace and you want me to share, with, share, people, share to people about Jesus, then I'm going to do it. If you want me to live my life for you in my workplace, I'll do it. If it's wherever you want me to go, it's not just when I select or where I select, but he says go. Because you, you look here, he says he sent the, the master sent the guy out already, sent him out into the nice place. They gave out the invitations. They went out to some of the local area, and he came back and he said, look, there's still room. Look what he told him. He said, now I want you to go to the highways and the hedges. Now he says, go to the places that might not be so welcoming to you. Go out to those people that might not be able to uh, look like you or talk like you or act like you. Go everywhere to compel them to come in. So we're not worried about the quality of person either. And I'm not running anyone down, but that's sometimes in our minds. We want to go only to the people that we like, only to the people that look like us, only to the people that sound like us, only the type of people that have what we have. And you want me to go and, and talk to others? Absolutely. So, man, you go to the highways and hedges because you're not worried about the convenience. You're not worried about the, 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 the location of where he's sending you. You're not even worried about the people he's sending you to. Go to them compel them beg them to come in which brings me to the last part here of this word is compel he says you go and compel them in other words kind of get a little fire lit under you church listen i truly believe that we as the church not just at west but the church in general we need a fire lit under us we got to get urgent we got to go out and, and to, to try to get people because you know what? It's more than just inviting them to church. He says, go and compel them. Don't just invite them. Hey, we'd lo- we're having a special service. We'd love to have you come. Thank you. Good. We'll see you later. No, he says, have a sense of urgency. Because again, it's more than just inviting. It's an imperative. It's a command appealing in love and by the example of those that we wish to bring to Christ appealing to them, begging them, if you will. This idea of is the imperative, again, is that appealing in love. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now listen to what he says. As though God were pleading through us. Amen. What is pleading? Pleading is crying out begging people why would we think that we're begging because we know what is ahead of them we've been told over and over and over that there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus but since there's now no condemnation to us then what does that mean for those who are not in Christ Jesus that there is condemnation there is a place called hell There is a separation from God. There's a place where there is no peace. There is no joy. There is no comfort. He says, you go and you're an ambassador for Christ as the church. That we're pleading. God is pleading through us. That we implore you. We beg you. We cry out to you. Be reconciled to God. That's why we talk about the church being the hands and the feet and the voice of Christ. Because we're his ambassador. Folks, we should be desiring. Let me rephrase that. We should be aching for people to come to Jesus. We should be aching for that, not just wanting it, not just saying, oh, it would be nice if people come to Jesus. 
No, he says, you're an ambassador. You implore them to come. The idea, the Latin origin of the origin of the word implore means to invoke with tears. Man, that's, that's heartbreaking, amen? If we're brought to tears over it, that means it really means something to us. He said, that's what you ought to be doing. You ought to be imploring, begging with tears. Why? The question is why. Why, folks? Why should we hear? Why should you at home? Why should we have such a sense of urgency? It's very simple. Jesus is coming again. Okay, another shot. All right, you know it's coming, so be ready. Why should we have such an urgency in our spirit to bring people to Jesus? My friends, because Jesus is coming again. Do you remember a time in church that that was talked about a lot? Jesus is coming again. Man, we need to understand that that same Jesus who died on the cross for us, who was buried in the tomb, three days later he arose and he spoke to people and he taught people. And then later on, Jesus ascended into heaven. And you remember the angels, what they said? Don't sit here staring because that same Jesus that you just saw leave, he's coming back he's coming folks listen that's the message we need to get out because i want to tell you we don't know when it is but i want to tell you this there's not much time for you to come to christ if you're here today there's not a whole lot of time left i believe jesus is coming i believe he's coming soon now a lot of people say well preach been saying that for now 50 60 100 years 2000 years they've been saying it well, guess what? Those people that started saying it are no longer saying it because they're with Jesus. Amen. Those people that were preaching it about 60 years ago, guess what? Many of them aren't saying it anymore. Why? Because they're with Jesus. Time goes by pretty fast. So all we that are older know that. Amen? Now the kids are going, we'll never grow up. <laughs> I, I saw today or yesterday a sign that says, man, I remember when I was saying I can't wait to grow up was the dumbest thing I ever thought. I should have never said that. Amen. Folks, listen. I just celebrate. <clears throat> I just celebrated. Turn him. 58. Oh, don't. Whoa. Who said that? Stop it. Hey, I just turned. I still can't even say it yet. 58. But can I tell you something? It has gone by so fast. Man, I remember yesterday when I was at school, and I remember putting up the sign of the kids that in my classes and in my school put up a sign that said, Happy 23rd birthday, Mr. Gacious. Yesterday they did that, Jesse, yesterday. Folks, we can't say that we've got a lot of time because even if Christ tarries another 100 years, can I tell you, a majority of us aren't going to be there then. Time is short. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, the Bible says don't wait till tomorrow. Do it today. Today is the day of salvation. So if you're here in this room and you don't know Jesus, I boy, if I could... I'd come out there and I'd, I'd fall on my knees. I'd beg any of you that, I, that says, I don't think I know Jesus. I'd beg you to come to Jesus because we don't know tomorrow. We're never promised tomorrow. Now, I'm not going to be like an evangelist go, well, many of you may die going home today. No, I'm going to pray all of you get home, all right? I want you to get home safely today. But, but I'm telling you, folks, tomorrow's not promised to us. We need Jesus today. So not only is it not, there's not a lot of time for you, but there's not a lot of time left for the church to give out. Jesus is coming for the church. There's going to come a time that he's going to call with the voice of the archangel of God and the trumpet of God will sound and the dead in Christ will rise and those who remain shall be wrapped up in the air with them and together forever to be with the Lord. Amen. Jesus is coming, folks. We don't got a lot of time. Most of us don't have... I don't have another 50 more years to do this. 
So time is short. So why? Why do we beg? Why do we cry out? Why do we plead? Why do we fall on our knees with tears? Because again, Jesus is coming soon. And the thing I want to wrap up here, begin to wrap up is this. He says, tell them to come. The offer is open to everyone. Can I tell you, there's these three things. It's open to you and open to you at home regardless of your past. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. It's open to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, you can have eternal life. It's open to you today, right here, right now. I don't care what's going on right now in your life. I don't care the present situation you're in. Nothing is too great for the saving grace of Jesus Christ. It's open to you. He says, tell them to come. Whoever will come, I will let them in. Tell them to come. And regardless of your circumstances, doesn't matter who you are or where you live or what you have or what you don't have. It's open to anyone. All you got to do is come. And can I tell you, there's room. There's room. He said, I have gone to everywhere I go, but yet there's still room. The availability, my friend, for you here or you at home, there's room for you in Jesus' life. There's room for you in Jesus' eternity. There's room for you. Come today. Because I want you to know this. There will be no rejection from the Savior. Listen, you can't, you can't get that anywhere else in the world. Amen? There's going, hey, can I tell some of you, all of you, there's some places in the world none of us can get into. We, we're, it's an exclusive club, and they would not let us in for anything. But can I tell you this? There's room for you, and the Savior is waiting, and he will not, he will not reject you if you'll call on his name. I'd like to have the praise team to come on back up now as we step into this time. Man, I, I'm, I'm going to, to ask you today, as the praise team is coming, to think about a couple of things. One, are you here today? Or are you at home? Do you know for sure that you have Jesus in your life? Not that you're a good person. I didn't ask you that. I didn't ask if you're a bad person. I didn't ask if you're rich or poor. I didn't ask you anything. But do you know that you have Jesus in your heart? And you say, well, how can I know? Look back and say, has there ever been a point in your life that you realized you needed Jesus? That you were lost and you were empty and you were hopeless. But then you realize that Jesus came and died on the cross for you and you cried out, Lord, I know that I need you and I need that sacrifice that only Jesus can give. And God, today, I ask you, would you come into my heart and save me? If you've never done that, I don't care how good you are, I don't care how many times you've attended church, I don't care how many times you've watched this on the live stream, none of that matters. But that you've received Jesus through faith. That's what we're going to do today. But also, if you're here and you know you have Christ in your heart, do you have that refreshing spirit that continues to flow? Or is there something in your heart, something in your life that has kind of blocked that and now you've gotten caught up in the world and, man, you would, you would love today, you would love today to just be refreshed by the Spirit of God breathing in you breathing over you today. Man, you can have that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as we now step into this invitation time, I'm going to do something I did in the first service I rarely ever do. But I have such an urgency on my spirit. I just need to ask you. Ask you at home. Is there any of you here today that say, Pastor, I don't know that I have Jesus in my heart. Or maybe you can say, I know I don't. I've never asked him to save me. Just between me and you. And I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to do anything but just pray for you.
But I, I have to know as your pastor, as your friend, as this person that loves you, if you're here today, or maybe you at home, get a hold of us. Call the office. But if you're here today and you can say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know that I have Jesus. Or maybe you say, Pastor, I know I'm not. Here's what I want you to do. Every head bowed and every eye closed. No one's looking. And I'm not going to ask you to do anything except this so that I can pray with you, pray for you. Would you just look up at me right, real quick and just look at me? Okay? Okay? Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? That's all I'm asking. I'm not coming to you. Good. If you raise your head, looked at me, and some of you did. And if you're at home and you, you would be looking at me now, if you could. Here's what I want you to do now. I want you to pray. Pray with faith. Knowing that you need Jesus. And I want you to repeat after me. Father, thank you for bringing me here today. Thank you for letting me watch this service today. And thank you, God, for convicting my heart, making me realize I need you. So, Father, it's by faith that I ask you as the only sacrifice that you forgive me of my sins. I ask you to save me as I receive you into my life. Thank you, God, for your grace and for saving me. Oh, if you prayed that prayer, I want to celebrate with you. If you at home prayed that prayer, would you call our church? Man, I want to pray with you. If God spoke into your heart and you prayed that prayer and you, you prayed that prayer, all I, all I ask you to do one more thing for me. Just quickly, with no one else watching, and don't even, that way you won't bump the next person. If you prayed that prayer, again, just, I'm not coming to you. I just want to pray over you. Would you quickly just raise your hand and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Anyone? Amen. Anyone else? Oh, the angels in heaven are rejoicing over the one. Anyone else? Oh, then I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rejoice over the one or two that came, said they were saved. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rejoice then that everyone else in this room honestly believes they're saved. Praise God that you've received Jesus into your heart. But remember, it's got to be through him, not anything else. Amen. Now, for you that know you're saved or you say you're saved, I want to ask you, is there anyone in this room that needs me to pray for you? Because you realize you're saved, but man, you know that that fire has not been burning in your spirit for a while. And you say to me, just pastor, just pray for me because I, I want that. Amen. Already, your hands are going up. If you'd raise your hand, amen, amen, all over. Pastor, I want that fire in me. I want to commit my heart to reaching people, appealing to them on Christ's behalf. I want my life to count. Amen. Then in just a moment, we're going to sing. If God leads you, I'm not going to ask you to do anything else from here except if God's led you would you come and, and come to the altars and pray come and let me pray with you let me rejoice with you come and let someone else pray with you clear things as we get ready here in just a few moments to step into the Lord's Supper that you can enter in with your heart right with God your spirit renewed the altars are open I'll be down front. Others will come if you need to come. Father, hear us today and let us work as you desire. In Jesus' name.
Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and would you sing this great song with us? If you need to come, and some have already come, would you come this morning? Let me pray with you. Amen. God is good. God is amazing. He's got a feast, a, an amazing feast ready for us. Would you come?